Good morning. Uh, my name is Jeff Reese. I'm the lead robot inspector for the Peachtree District. And we're going to talk a little bit today about the inspection process. The slide up here is still titled Infinite Recharge. And we call it Reloaded because we are going to play this game again uh, at Grits. And this may be the first time you'll experience the inspection process. I know a lot of teams have uh, lost experienced people. So we're going to talk in terms of Infinite Recharge. Partly because, again, we're going to play it at Grits, and partly because I don't know what the new game looks like in terms of rules yet. So here we go. Inspections. All right. All right. How do I get to make the next slide? Try page up, Jeff. Yeah, I'm on this silly Mac, though. I don't have. Oh. Uh... It was working in my practice. There we go. Try the right. All right. Perfect. There you go. Uh, robot inspection is a required element of playing our game. And we're still playing for this, our purposes of the 2020 rules. And it requires that each robot must pass an inspection at each robotics competition to confirm their compliance with the rules and such, and to allow them to participate in the, the competition event. And what translates to is, your robot has to go through an inspection and it has to pass that inspection before you're going to be allowed to play uh, any of our games. And we're going to talk today about how we do that. Now, this chart, I realize nobody can really see at this level. And the only reason I've included it is to show that there actually is a process for the inspection. Essentially, it, it amounts to bringing your robot to the inspection table, starting a process, completing the full inspection and having the documentation done. Um, if you want, we can get you a copy of this chart, but essentially this is a guide for the, instruct, uh, the inspectors. And the whole point here is that there is a formal process that we're going to try to follow. Now, your job is to get through that process successfully. Well, we're going to talk today about how not to do that. What, what are some things that you can do that will almost guarantee that you will not pass inspection? Well, the easiest way to do this is just don't read the rules. Uh, the rules are the rules are not exactly the most exciting reading in the world. There is no video for it. There is no concise part of it. And one of the things we find is that teams, particularly experienced teams, we've done this before. We know what we're going to be doing, and it'll be the same as last year. Well, in some parts of the rules, yeah, things don't change a lot. Sometimes they do. I've had teams show up who obviously haven't read the rules because they just are in flagrant violation of this year's rules. Yes, it was legal last year or maybe the year before, but it isn't this year. And the other side of that question is that basically, because I don't want to read the rules, because I don't want to go through the effort of understanding them, I'll ask a question on Chief Delphi, or I'll see something somewhere where uh, some team Maybe one of the more experienced, maybe one of the Hall of Fame teams says to do it this way. Or maybe a robot in three days is showing how they're building their rules. Well, those guys are doing it. It's got to be okay. It isn't necessarily true. I like Chief Delphi, it's a lot of information, but Chief Delphi is not official. What Team X does isn't official. The only things that are official are the rules as published, any team updates, and the official first Q&A. So if it's not in there, it's not going to be accepted. Second big thing that people tend to do a lot is they pay no attention to any size or weight limit given in the rules. There are two absolute hard limits in the rules for your robot to be acceptable, and they are the size and the weight. These are completely non-negotiable. Close enough isn't good enough. Um, they're, I say they're hard because two things. One, I've got no, no judgment call in, I can, I can rule the ass ah, close enough and I'll let you go. And two, they are hard to fix. You don't have a lot of time at these competition events to deal with these kind of issues. So let's just build a robot right up to the limits that we're given. You don't want to leave any space on the table. You don't want to have any. Uh, anything left out. Well, that's fine, except the term tolerances 
which I'm sure you're familiar with or your mentor will explain to you. Tolerance is stack. And if you're trying to build right up to, let's call it the size of this time, in the past couple of years, it's been 120 inches of frame perimeter, and you go slightly over, I, you're, you're done. You've got to make your robot smaller. And a lot of you folks are designing in CAD, and that's perfectly fine. Your CAD drawing says it'll, it'll fit. But if you don't cut precisely, don't assemble precisely, and don't account for those tolerances, you may not fit. And if you do not fit the size, you do not pass inspection. So building to the limits and relying upon your CAD drawings, easy ways to not get through your inspection. Mention size. Well, we've been doing this for a number of years with what's termed the frame perimeter. Used to be we actually had a box you'd stick your robot into and the bo a robot had to fit safely inside that box. We now use frame perimeter. Frame perimeter is defined in the rules and it's not a particularly complicated thing, but a lot of times you find people misunderstanding it and some element of the robot is above that defined frame perimeter. That, that doesn't count against my size. Well, the frame perimeter is an infinitely tall extension. It has to be within the frame perimeter of your robot. You cannot fall outside of it at the start. And if it's outside this, uh, the frame perimeter at the start, it's not a legal robot, I can't let you play. Yeah, they're gonna let me, they're gonna let me get away with this. I'm a little bit oversized, but it's only a minor protrusion. Yes, the rules do allow for minor protrusions. They are referring to a small bolt head, a rivet head, perhaps a screw head, something very, very small that sticks just slightly out of the frame perimeter and doesn't really cause a problem. A major bolt head or a bolt head that can be easily turned the other way around or something that basically is sticking out significantly is not gonna be considered a minor protrusion. And it can be as little as a bolt head sometimes. Uh, we had an event where we had a robot that had four bolts in the top of its structure. Three of them were button heads, excuse me, yeah, three of them were flat heads. One was a button head and they built right to the limit. Well, the three flat heads, because they were in recessed uh, portions, passed the height limit. The button head kept hitting the height limit. It's not, not gonna cut it. You, you, you've exceeded the ability there and it's obvious you could have done it right Robot didn't get the plane until they fixed it. Again, I do not know what the rules are going to be for this year. In the past, the rules have allowed for alternative configurations. You can build a tall robot that maybe has a small frame perimeter and build a big frame perimeter with a short robot. These are either or situations. You can't mix and match. You can't choose the dimensions that you want. And I've had several robots show up at competitions where they've tried to make it as wide as the rules could possibly allow and as tall as the rules could possibly allow. And once again, it's not allowable and these are hard things to fix. Size is a hard thing to fix. Back again to paying no attention to size or weight. Hard limits. If you do not pay attention to the weight of your robot during your build period and Seems like 125 pounds, which is the allowance last year. Typically, it's been 120 pounds, but it's 120, 125 for the same general ballpark. It seems like that's a lot of weight. And besides, I can always make it lighter later. Well, yeah, maybe you can, but making it light after you've built it, after all your hardware is aboard, after all your mechanism is aboard, after all the things you've worked hard on to make your robot competitive, it's not so easy to make it lighter. Uh, I learned this lesson the hard way back one time when I was helping a team. We went to our scrimmage knowing we were going to be a little bit heavy, but didn't have the full mechanism aboard because it was still being worked on. We put it on the scale, and I was already at 120 pounds, and I knew I had almost 25 pounds of stuff back at the shop that we wanted to add. There was no way I was going to make that robot fit. We had to basically in three days between the scrimmage and uh, back in those days when we had a stop work date, a ship date, we had to basically gut our robot to make it meet the well requirements. If you have 125 pounds as a limit, keep careful track of your weight and plan to be a little bit under. Because again, if you're 125.1 pounds on our scale, you're not gonna get to play the game. 
If the rules allow alternative configurations, again, you cannot mix and match. The weight limit is a hard limit. If they allow alternative configurations, the limit for that configuration is a definite thing. You have to make that weight. Jeff, can I intervene right here, please? Yes, uh, just uh, one other thing regarding weights. Be careful with your scales, please. Uh, we have had incidents where uh, they have weighted on their scale and find out that their scale is nowhere near accurate. So we highly suggest that uh, if you have a scale of some sort of that you get some type of definite known mechanism for determine the accuracy of your scale. We, uh, uh, you, you, you had that happen, right, Jeff? I yeah. think somebody yeah. came in and said, well, weigh this one <laughs> at the school, but it was way overweight when it got to us. In, in response to Mr. Dellinger, gee, Charles, okay, Dellinger's comment, um, the scale at our events is the quote unquote official scale. Uh, it has been calibrated by a, a scale shop and we have weights. We check its calibration and we trust that scale. I really, I can't defend uh, that you weighed it at your school and you weighed 119 and a half pounds and our scale you weigh 120.3. I'm, I'm sorry, this is the scale we have to use. Uh, so do pay attention to your weights and to the best of your ability, leave a little bit on the table. It's far, far easier to add weight than it is to take it off. We're back to how not to pass that inspection. Well, I didn't need to read the rules. We discussed that, you know, I, there's no need to read those rules. I know what I'm doing. Well, the rules change sometimes. Team updates will make a change to a rule, particularly after any week zero events. The game design committee plans this and thinks they have it under control. They play the week zero events and find out it doesn't work quite the way we thought it was going to, and they'll issue an update. Those updates become part of the official rules. They may change something that affects your robot. But again, I pay attention to it. It's got no bearing on me, right? I highly recommend that your team have some sort of a rules czar or somebody responsible for keeping track of all the rules, any changes, or any modifications made by updates. If you don't have somebody responsible for it, how do you know you're still in compliance with the rules? Uh, it, it's a lot better to have one person riding herd on that than having everybody think they know what they're doing and nobody really knowing about it. And again, I come back to Chief, Dive, Chief Delphi will tell you about it. Yeah, they'll discuss changes. They'll make comments. They'll pass on information. But I have to reiterate, Chief Delphi is not an official source of information in the first world. It's a tremendous source of information. It's a great place to get help. It's a great place to get ideas, a great place to ask questions. But you cannot rely upon a Chief Delphi answer. Uh, Al Skirkowitz is the lead robot inspector for FIRST. And Al will frequently show up on Chief Delphi and he'll, he'll answer questions. And while Al is the ultimate robotics inspection authority, just because he said it on Chief Delphi does not mean it's right. So pay attention to the rules, pay attention to the updates. Okay, let's get creative about how not to pass our inspection. The two easiest things to do that will get the interest of your inspector almost as he walks into your pit are bumpers, bumpers and safety. Now, bumpers are related. Bumpers are a safety requirement. You must have a set of bumpers on your robot and they must conform to the requirements of the rules. This is considered a safety factor and the, un, the guiding principle that all inspectors go by and all of us goes by is that unsafe robots do not play our game. So if your bumpers don't meet the requirements, it is by definition an unsafe robot and is by definition not able to play. Now bumpers seem simple and unfortunately teams typically tend to approach them almost as an afterthought. Uh, again, back when we had to uh, bag or box our robots, we had a limited time frame. In other words, the typical approach was to let's build our robot and we'll figure out how to put bumpers on it later. Well, Sometimes after you've got it built, get those bumpers on, it's a lot harder than you think it is. 
Think about how those bumpers are going to go on your robot, where they're going to go, and how they're going to be attached. Pay attention to the bumper section rules. You know, you can't just slap anything on there and get it past the inspection process. And bumpers, again, they're not horribly difficult, but it takes time to fix them. And time is sometimes a precious commodity at an event. So having a good set of bumpers gets your inspector, A, he's got a lot more faith in what he's seeing, and B, he doesn't spend a lot of time inspecting them and helping you work through them. Just for use and adapt last year's set? Well, maybe. Were they legal last year? Do they fit your robot this year? Do they meet the requirements this year? Do they uh, span gaps where they have to, et cetera, et cetera? Yes, you can reuse last year's bumpers, and yes, you can adapt them, but they still have to meet this year's requirements. They may have been illegal last year and just not gotten caught. It happens sometimes. Even if you build new bumpers, think about how you're going to put them on. Somehow or other, I have to get those bumpers onto my robot, and they have to stay on there. And robots that shed bumpers at an event, A, they just became unsafe because they don't have a bumper, and B, they're not allowed to shed parts on the field, both of which can lead to your robot being disabled on the field and you're, you're done for the match. Bumpers. Team numbers have to be on your bumpers. Well, that's great. Uh, they're on there so that the referees, so that the commentators, so that people watching can identify your robot. Uh, in the heat of battle, it's sometimes a little hard to keep track of what's going on, so the numbers help everybody sort it out. But the team numbers have requirements in the rules. You can't just stick anything you want them. I've seen people show up with beautiful bumpers in a very attractive font and in their team colors. First doesn't allow that. First specifies what they have to be. First wants them in white. Uh, I've seen bumpers come with your team, your school, your sponsor logo on them, you know, and I, I really appreciate the fact that you recognize and are proud of your team, your school, or the sponsors helping you make you, make you successful in this exercise. They look great. First doesn't allow it. The only thing they'll allow you to put on there is your team number and a first logo. So pay attention to what your bumpers look like. One of the biggest issues with bumpers is I got to have two sets. I've got to be able to show bumpers for a red alliance and bumpers for a blue alliance. Now, one of two things, I built two sets of bumpers and a mechanism that allows me to change bumpers from one side to the other, one color to the other, or a lot of teams are going to two color reversible bumpers. It does make your life easier at a competition, but you got to do it right. A reversible bumper has to be clearly red or blue. Now this one isn't the worst example I've ever seen by far, but what color am I showing? Yeah, it's primarily blue, but it's showing a lot of red. Is that a red bumper or a blue bumper? And then more importantly, look at that gap at the corner there where you've got the, the blue triangle, excuse me, the red triangle showing. That isn't showing the color properly. It isn't showing my team number properly. And we're gonna have a couple examples here. I, I hate to pick on this team, but this is an actual robot that we saw. And it just, it had a lot of things I could use pictures with. So there's the same robot trying to show a blue side. And uh, what do you think is wrong with this picture? What's the team number? The bumper got put on upside down. Now, is it still a bumper? Sure. But is it a legal bumper at that point in time? I can't tell what that bumper is, what, what that team number is. Here's the yeah, same robot. They turned the bumper over and they reversed the color. Well, it was, excuse me, it's a different robot. I apologize, it's a different, a different number. Um, is it team number 30? I know for a fact this robot is not team number 30. Where's the rest of the, dump, uh, the numbers? And the bumper is not sitting in a horizontal plane. That isn't inherently evil because the bumper zone has tolerance. As long as it's within the bumper zone, I'm okay. But how well attached is it hanging like that? See that large gap on the left-hand side? That's an unprotected corner. That's not a legal bumper. 
This is a reversible bumper, I suspect. Look on the right-hand side and see all that fabric hanging down. That fabric may or may not be within the bumper zone depending upon the year. Sometimes the bumper zone goes all the way to the floor, sometimes it doesn't. Either way, that bumper cover is hanging loose and can get easily damaged and ripped off the robot. Something we don't want to have, and your inspectors can give you a hard time with that. We're back to colors. Is that a red bumper or a blue bumper? And we're back to the same robot. You can see that left hand bumper is upside down. Uh, it's just kind of a, a summary of what we've been talking about. That particular robot has challenges with its bumpers. Your inspector is going to spend some time looking at your bumpers, and if he's not happy with them, you're going to have to fix them before he's going to sign off and allow you to play. So pay attention to your bumpers. They, it seems like it is a trivial thing, but it is probably the biggest cause of problems during the inspection process. Another comment here uh, for you uh, people is the fact that some of the rules have changed in the past, so you no longer have to have a number. Uh, Jeff, can you back that up uh, one slide there? I can try. Okay. Nope. Wrong way. Nope, I guess it is. Yeah, there we go. Anyhow, uh, the new rules only require you to have a set of numbers uh, on each side. You no longer have to have numbers on each exposed. It used to be where you'd have to have numbers on both the left and the right hand side of that picture, but that has recently been changed. But again, you will need to check the rules to make sure that that's still allowable. Yeah, the rules used to require the number to be contiguous. They have since allowed it to be split across an opening like that. But that may or may not be in this year's rules. It really kind of depends on what the game design committee says. Uh, I do expect that Mr. Engler said that that will continue to be allowed, but I don't know. I haven't seen the rules. I won't see them any sooner than you do. Uh, so whatever the rules require, just be prepared to do it. Second big issue with the inspection process is overall safety of your robot. One of the inspector's primary duties is to make sure that the, your robot is safe. And it is safe not only for you, it is safe for the field, people on the field, the field reset people, the other robots that are interacting with. And safety is always uh, the prime duty or the prime objective of uh, a first process. Your inspector is the one who decides if it's safe or not. It is up to his discretion. If he doesn't like something and deems it unsafe, you will have to fix it before it is allowed on the field. So take a little time to just pay attention to it. One of the biggest issues we find as inspectors is you've been building your robot, you've been living with it, you know where the various bits and pieces are, you know that Sally got her hand cut over here and that Billy got his finger uh, jabbed over there, and you know not to do those things. We don't, nor are the other people. And if he finds those kind of issues, he's going to ask you to fix them. Pneumatics. You may or may not have pneumatics in your robot. Pneumatics are great for a lot of things, but there are several safety items in the pneumatics that must be addressed. The rules require you must have, non-negotiable, a master pressure release that lets all of the air out of the system by opening that one valve. And that means that all the air that you might have in a pneumatic cylinder that's holding something, or all the air you might have that's trying to lift something or, or pull something back in, has to be released by opening that valve. That switch, that master pressure device, has to be somewhere it can be gotten to. You can't just stick it down some space in the robot and kind of hide it away while it may fit down there and you know where it is, remember that the FTA, the field reset people, referees, somebody on the field who does not know your robot has to be able to get to it quickly if it's causing a problem. Your inspector will insist that that be in a particularly noticeable, easily reached space. And if it's not there, you'll rework the pneumatics until it is there because again, this is a safety element. Pneumatics builds up a lot of energy in its systems. And for safety purposes, first limits us to 120 PSI in any storage system. 
and I cannot use more than 60 PSI anywhere in the robot. And you've got to be able to show your inspector that those limits are being maintained. That means you have to have gauges, visible gauges on the store side of your system and the working side of your system. It can be less than 60, but it can't be more. And putting those gauges where they're impossible to see is going to not make your inspector's day. It's going to make his life difficult, and you're going to have to convince him that those gauges are correct. So just think a little bit when you design your pneumatic system. Where do I put that pressure release? Where do I put those gauges? Make it so that your inspector can see them and verify you've complied with requirements. Again, safety. The rules require non-negotiable a pressure relief valve to limit the maximum pressure in the system. I'm walking along, I've got something on my uh, robot, got a cylinder out in it. I've reached outside my frame perimeter and I run into something and that system gets compressed. The cylinder gets pushed back. I can exceed 120 PSI in my system and I have to have a valve to limit that pressure. First describes it, they specify a couple specific valves that you have to have in there. Those valves are not factory calibrated. Your inspector will test them as part of your inspection process. They're not horribly difficult to adjust, but depending on where you've hidden it away, it may be hard to get to. They can be set to less than 125 PSI. That's the limit that's required. But if you pack, if you don't calibrate it and you package it away, the inspector has got to figure out how to get into it. He's got to help you adjust it. And it's going to take time. It's going to make complications that you may have to rework your pneumatic system before you can even do it. And your inspection system at the very least is going to be slowed down. So again, as part of the pneumatic side, think about where I'm going to put that pressure relief valve so that somebody can get to it and we can calibrate, check its calibration. Electric power. This is the other area we see a lot of issues with. You're required to have a main breaker that basically shuts off all the power in your robot. And once again, teams like to stick it down somewhere in the robot. It'll be protected from accidental contact, be hard to trip. And that's perfectly fine. You know where it is. You know how to turn it on and off. But unfortunately, the people on the field don't know where it is, don't know how to get to it, don't know how to turn that robot off, and they're the ones who are going to have to get there if there's a problem. Once again, your inspector is going to want to see that up someplace where it can be gotten to easily as a relatively obvious location. Now, you do have to protect it from accidental contact. You don't want somebody bumping it and actually turn your robot off, and we understand that. So some protection around it is fine. Your inspector may require you to add a label, just a uh, we usually have an inspection station, just a, a big red arrow basically enabled main breaker to call attention to it. As long as it's in a reasonably accessible space, it'll be fine. He may ask you to add that, but that's, that'll be fine with the inspection process. If it's not in a good space, he may require you to relocate it so that you can get to it and you put the arrow on it to point at it. Batteries. Just dropping your battery in your robot, it's going to be safe enough. Well. That battery has a lot of energy in it. It's capable of welding, it's capable of vaporizing metal. And we want it safely held down. Here's a couple of real examples. If I don't secure it properly, and I don't protect my wiring properly, and it happens to go to ground, I destroy batteries. And the criteria given to us from first as inspectors is that battery should be secure enough in its position safe enough for making accidental contact that if I were to pick your robot up, turn it upside down and shake it, the battery won't move. Because if the battery does move, it causes damage like this or even worse. How am I going to hold that battery in place? Zip ties, not considered an attachment mechanism. Duct tape, as useful and as wonderful it is, is not a sufficient battery hold down. You need something that will keep that battery in place. Uh, a Velcro strap, a buckled strap, a metallic clamp hold down, as long as it's sufficiently uh, 
far away from the battery terminals. Those are the kind of things that we're looking for. Because if that battery doesn't, oh, excuse me a minute. The picture's not quite where I thought it was. If that battery is not held down securely, there are problems. So the other thing that we're going to be looking for is wiring. First is very explicit in what they want. Again, this chart is something you'll find in your rule book. Don't expect you to be able to read it here. But the inspectors can look at the wiring that you have installed. Wiring must meet certain criteria. And the criteria it must meet are determined by the breaker that it is connected to. If you put a 40 amp breaker in, I don't care how small the load is on the other end of it, you must comply with the wiring requirement for 40 amps. The only alternative if your wire is improperly sized is to change the breaker or to rewire it. Neither one of which is a lot of fun for you. Changing the breaker limits the power you can have. Rewiring it takes time and effort. And first has a wiring code. Yes, the electrons can't see color, they're colorblind, they don't know what's going on. But first requires you to use specific uh, colors of wiring. I don't care how beautiful your wiring job is, if you do not comply with the wiring color code, you will have to redo it. I've seen robots beautifully wired in all green wire. Green, green is an acceptable color for some things, but not for everything. So look at the wiring code, pay attention, and your inspector will be very happy if you're consistent with it. Just because it allows two or three different colors for a uh, different class of wire, doesn't mean you have to use all three colors. It makes his job much easier and yours easier if you're consistent in your uh, wiring codes. Wire management. Your inspector does not know your robot. He's got to troubleshoot any problem with it and figure out what's going on. If you walk, if we walk into a robot that looks like the one on the left, A, we know we got a problem. B, it's going to take us time and effort, <coughs> excuse me, time and effort to follow through that wiring and make sure it's legal. Pay attention to your wiring. I wish I had a good picture of a nice wiring job. Uh, they're out there on the web. It's relatively easy to do, but run your wires neatly. Make them easy to follow. Follow the color code, label them, and give it a nice professional appearance. And your inspector, A, you put the effort into making it right, He's going to be a lot more confident in that the job was done right and not going to have to check every nut and bolt of detail of the wiring job. So again, wire management. We walk into a robot that looks like the one on the left and we know we probably got problems. We walk in a nice, clean, neat one and we still got to check it, but we're a lot more confident that you've done your job right. It's easier for us to check. Jeff, like also make another comment because I find uh, <laughs> back on that slide again. Thank you. Uh, as you notice uh, that the uh, PD, uh, PDU board, which is the power distribution board, is buried. Uh, you cannot see the uh, fuses. You can't see much of anything. Uh, this also slows our inspection process severely down because we have to dig down there to see, first of all, that you got the proper wire terminated in, in the uh, uh, correct position, and then we also need to check to see that your fuses are correct. There's several things that occur on that uh, power distribution board that we need to see in order to complete the inspection. Thank you, Jeff. And and having said that, uh, I have had several times had robots where the power distribution board is nicely done, but it's tucked away someplace you can't really see it. It needs to be visible. Uh, doesn't mean it needs to be out in the available uh, on the very surface layer, but it's got to be someplace where the inspector can see it, because as Mr. Engler just said, we have several things we have to check on that board, and if I can't get to it and can't see it, it just complicates our life and therefore your life more than is necessary. There have been a number of teams that have decided to put their electronics on the bottom side of the robot. And again, perfect. wrong with that? As long as we can get to it. As long as we can get to it and flip it over to look, you know, you're welcome to do that. Uh, the one I saw best, and this was quite some time ago, and I wish to God I'd taken the pictures of it, but the entire uh, main wiring system was a little cube that slid into the robot. They would slide it on drawers and it would unfold. And all the stuff was laying there nice and neat and organized. 
And when you got done with these specs, they folded it back up and slid it back into the robot. It was really well done. I, I wish I had pictures of it, but at the time, I just didn't have a picture. What can I say? Wire management. We're back to one of the things that we want to look at. One of the reasons we want to see that PDP board is are the wires in there properly? Are they not sticking out somewhere? Do I not have stray whiskers? Do I not have improperly connected wires? Because if I don't do it correctly, this is what can happen. I go to short, I burn up the PDP, I burn up all the wiring to it, I can burn up other components. And you may have done it quote unquote correctly, but perhaps you didn't catch an unsafe situation. The inspectors are looking for correctness, but we're also looking for safety. We don't want to see that happen to your robot. And they may ask you to re insulate some wires. They may point out places that are, I want to say substandard, that's not quite the right word, but less than optimal. I cannot make you do things that we think are less than good practice unless they are unsafe. But your inspector may point out that you might want to think about doing this to help prevent situations like that. And again, if you don't want to do that, this is what can happen. That robot caught fire. Now, the field people were able to put it out without doing horrible damage, but they used a chemical fire extinguisher and that robot was contaminated with whatever the chem chemical suppressant is. I honestly don't know what the materials are to put out an electrical fire. Not only was the robot contaminated, so was the field, which then had to be short. Just short of carbon, uh, think of it, disulfate. You know, it, it, yeah, it's fire it's extinguisher. A, yeah, just, but it's a chemical material. It's all over your robot. It's all over the field. Uh, that robot was pretty much out for the competition, and we lost uh, competition time when we cleaned up the field. So when the inspector tells you that you've got a, a wire that to him looks a little shaky, a little dodgy, you might want to fix it, we're trying to prevent this and this. It's not him trying to be difficult. He's trying to help you out. Earlier, I mentioned weight. I'd much rather be underweight than overweight. I can add things. Now, sometimes a light robot's a good thing. It depends on the game. But if I've got to climb something or lift myself up somewhere or do something that makes me is power ch uh, challenging, I may want a, a light robot. If I've got to reach high and I'm trying to stretch out over things, I need to have the base of the robot heavy enough that I don't tip over. So sometimes I'm adding ballast or weight that doesn't really do anything for me to bring my weight up to the legal limit. Zip ties are not considered a secure attachment. They need to be bolted down, clamped down, somewhere secured, so that again, if I pick it up, turn it upside down and shake it, that weight's not coming off. What can I use for weight? Nothing that'll spill on the field. You can't use sand. You can't use BBs. You can't lose, use lead shot unless it's encapsulated. I actually had a team one time show up wanting to add weight with a cardboard box, no tape on any of the seams, full of sand that they wanted to uh, duct tape onto the robot. And they were horribly disturbed when I said, no, you can't do that. All it takes is that robot being turned over, a little improper contact, we spread sand all over the field, and now I've got to clean that whole mess up and I've contaminated the field. Lead is a hazardous, hazardous material. I can't use lead of any kind unless it's properly encapsulated. I can't use BBs because they come loose, they're all over the field. And you don't want to play on a field full of BBs. We've got to take time to get them all off the field. I cannot use an extra battery, even if it's not wired to anything. The rules allow one and only one battery on the robot. I cannot put extra SIMs on as ballast unless the number of SIMs allowed on my robot isn't exceeded. If the rules allow eight SIMs, I'm only using six, I can put two more on. If it allows four, I can only put four on. So I can't just throw anything on there. And if I do use SIMs, I've still got to have them securely fastened. I can't use but one compressor. I can't add additional legal components, even if they're not being used beyond what the rules allow. 
Here's a really good way to make an inspector happy. Wait till the last possible minute before you start your inspection. After all, we got lots of time before now in our first match, and the practice field is open. I can be over there working as my robot rather than wasting my time getting inspected. You're still working on something. You got to get your goofinator mechanism working. You don't have time to stop right now and send your robot to inspection. I've got, still got things I got to do on the robot. And again, I got lots of time. We're not in the first couple of matches. We'll get inspected tomorrow morning. I'm going to spend all day today working on it. Still trying to get my software to work. I got to go to the practice field. The robot's not ready for inspection. These are all things that every team is facing. Practice field, we want to get on the practice field. We want to get stuff done. We want to work on the code. But remember, if you're not an inspected robot, you can't play. You have to be inspected to go to the field. So two major showstoppers, I'll come back to them again, size and weight. If we haven't gotten those dealt with, and you're waiting till the last minute. You've got a real problem. You've got to deal with it quickly, and they're hard to. So we encourage inspection, even if the robot is not fully, quote unquote, complete. Start the process. At least get size and weight out of the way. Those are hard to deal with. Get them done quick. Get them done early. And we'll let you know if you have a problem. We'll look at as much of the robot as you have, quote unquote, ready for us to look at. If I can look, if you're working on software, all your mechanisms are perfectly functional, I can still look at a lot of the mechanical components. I can look at your pneumatic system if you're still working on mechanical stuff. I can look at bits and pieces of it. As long as those parts meet inspection, we'll give you a quote unquote partial inspection to keep track of what has to be done. It greatly limits the amount of uh, effort required to finish the inspection that next morning. Inspectors are busy people. We've got 32, 48 teams to deal with and a relatively limited amount of time to get all these inspections done. And I can't always stop what I'm trying to do and respond to your need. Yeah, you're in the next match, but you haven't started your inspection is not a good excuse to run up and say, you got to come see me right now. We will try to accommodate as best we can, but understand we have a lot to do also, and we have to meet our duties. I can't always stop just to help you out and finish things out. You've passed your inspection. You've even gone to a match and you find out a problem. The design doesn't work quite the way you wanted it to. It doesn't work as well as you wanted it to. It needs something to be changed. We can change a widget in our robot to a gadget mechanism and we can add a framostat. That'll fix our problem. But we got a match coming up. I haven't got a whole lot of time. I got to get this done. There's no problem whatsoever with you changing your robot with adding things, modifying things, even adding a whole new device to it. Not a problem whatsoever, but you've got to allow for the fact that that robot, once you make a change, is now an uninspected robot. You've got to allow time for it to get inspected. So we know you're going to make changes. We know that you're going to modify your robot, but it wasn't inspected in the configuration you now have. By definition, an uninspected robot is an illegal robot. And you are subject to disqualification and the entire allowance that allows it to play is inspected, is it subject to disqualification. Any Q inspectors and field personnel are watching for changes. They, they see that your robot's made a change. But that means that you need to make sure that an inspector has looked at it, approved the change you made, and documented it. And I emphasize the word documented because I personally, at a championship match, had a robot that had been inspected, had made a change, and been reinspected, that took out a team that they thought they were going to win, and they tried to protest it. I had the documentation to prove that that robot went to the field legally. We are trying to help that your team achieve that. We do not want to have a team claim you're an illegal robot, and I can't prove that yes, it was inspected, and yes, it was approved. So all we're trying to do is make sure that we know what your robot looks like, we know it's still within the rules, and we can document that process. So just help us out. I don't care how minor it is. I don't care that it, you, you change a zip tie and you want us to look at it. I'd rather see something that I don't have to see than not see something I do have to. And by the way, changing a zip tie does not require a reinspection. Um, changing a component like for like does not require a reinspection. But again, 
I'd rather you told me you did it than you didn't tell me that you made a change that I did have to look at. One last thing to keep in mind, Ooh, be sure in time. Uh, we are your friend. We are, the entire inspection team is there to help you have a good experience. We're not an obstacle. We're not something difficult to deal with. We want to be part of your team. We are here to help you solve problems. If in the inspection process, we see something wrong, we will help you try to come up with a solution and help you try to do what you have to to make them, make your team successful. All we're asking in return is a little cooperation and some basic common sense. We want you to be successful. If both sides do their job right, this is fun. We're doing it because we enjoy it. We're hoping you enjoy it also. Anybody got any questions? No? Can't believe I did it that well, but okay. Just again, remember, the inspection team is there to help you. We are your friends. We'll work with you as best we possibly can. It is our job to put you on the field playing the game. So I hope to see you at GRITS. If I don't see you at GRITS, I will see you at the competition next year. Thank you for your time.